um, do that. All right. Well, hello, everyone. Thank you so much for attending our rare round on improving clinical transparency and data sharing. I'm just going to go over a couple housekeeping rules with you all um, before we get started, but we'll go through those quick so we can get the discussion going. Um, all of you are currently muted, um, but we do have a smaller group. So we really, really encourage um, adding to the conversation. Um, it's small enough where stay on mute if you have background noise, but feel free to unmute yourself and chime into the conversation and ask questions um, as you would like or as you have them and they come up. Um, we're also using the chat box, so if you can find that at the bottom of your screen. And then if you hit the participant, which is just to the left of chat box, um, there should be symbols on the bottom. So we've also been utilizing the hand raise. I have the list of the participant and can see when the hand raises up and I'll call on you and add to the discussion. We used that yesterday and I think it works pretty well, so we'll try it again today. Um, but we do have a smaller group, so really excited to see how the conversation um, is today. Um, in the interest of making us all feel more comfortable for discussion, I ask that everyone turn on their videos as you feel comfortable. Um, up to you, but would love to see all your faces in your new place of work or where you're, where you're at. Um, if you're having technical difficulties, remember to use the help desk in the lobby. Um, we have Global Gene staff there to ask, answer questions, as well as a tech team to help with anything you need on that end of things. Finally, we encourage you all to participate as active listeners and take advantage of the wonderful and knowledgeable moderators we have with us today. So I am pleased to now welcome TJ Sharp from Starfish Harbor and Jen McNary from J. McNary Consulting, our discussion moderators for today. They will start with a brief introduction of themselves and then lead us into the discussion. So I'm going to pull up some PowerPoint slides that we have and I will let TJ kick things off. Well, thank you, Rachel. Absolutely. As the slides come up and we navigate our new technical world, I will introduce myself. Uh, my name is TJ Sharp. Nice to meet all, I think I counted nine people so far in here. Um, appreciate you guys coming on our Friday afternoon. Uh, we're going to moderate a, a quick um, rare disease drugs development symposium on transparency and data access. Uh, my background is that I am a uh, I'm stage four melanoma survivor, uh, so I don't really have the rare disease background that many of you probably do, uh, but I've been fortunate that I have turned a, a, a very difficult diagnosis into a, a career path. Um, I, not only am I a survivor, uh, but I've, gone, I've been a veteran of two clinical trials, four immunotherapies, six surgeries, uh, I'll talk about the resume of some other time, uh, but the experience I had finding a trial, the difficulties finding a trial and getting the trial started, uh, finding the right medicine uh, for me uh, when I was diagnosed and given two years to live uh, has allowed me to start working as an advocate to get patients' treatments better, faster, safer, more effective. I work with, uh, I work with Jen, who I bet a lot of you already know um, as, a, as a patient advocate uh, with one of, one of the companies we work with together, uh, Medable, uh, but I also work within the pharmaceutical field and the clinical research world uh, as a patient advisor, uh, as part of advisory councils, uh, and really as the, uh, the consistent voice in the ear of, of the people who are developing medicines, developing clinical trials uh, that will hopefully uh, make the lives healthier of people, not just with melanoma, not just with cancer, uh, but with rare diseases, with hidden illnesses, uh, pretty much anyone that's going to be a patient, uh, I hope that I get to make uh, their life a little bit better. So uh, that's who I work with. Um, and one of the companies you'll hear about in a, in a moment is, is Transcelerate, which is actually a group of pharma companies that work together uh, to make clinical research better. So that's my background. Um, but I'm going to turn it over to the rare disease superstar, Jen McNary, to let her introduce herself. And we'll get started. And Jen, that little mute button, there yeah, you go. Yeah, I got it, I got it. I just noticed I muted myself. We've got some lawn mowing going on in the neighborhood here, so apologies. Um, so as, as TJ mentioned, my name is Jen McNary. Um, I'm a rare disease caregiver. Um, my two oldest sons were diagnosed uh, 18 years ago. Uh, they're now 21 and 18 with Duchenne muscular dystrophy. 
And then my 12 year old son, not to be outdone by his older brothers, um, was diagnosed with a different rare disease two years ago um, called primary immune deficiency. So I'm a rare mom times three, and I also have a healthy nine and a half year old daughter. Um, I turned what we experienced um, as patient and caregivers into a career in, in rare disease drug development as a consultant. Um, for these purposes today, what's was probably the most important part of my journey has been participating in clinical trials um, as the caregiver with my sons um, and also being part of the development of patient reported outcomes, being part of the um, development of registries um, and, and participating in, in data collection. And so it's been really important to me that everybody who contributes to data collection um, is part of that research team. And so when possible, I, I always encourage companies to make sure that patients are um, involved from the very beginning in um, deciding what types of data and what outcome measures um, should be collected. I'm lucky to be able to do that um, and convene advisory boards for my pharma partners now. Um, it wasn't something that was done as readily when my boys were diagnosed. Um, some other things that are important to me that I'm hoping that we'll touch on as a group today um, is, is sort of the responsibility to um, rare disease nonprofits and, and patient organizations to make sure that they're good stewards of their patients' data and that all data collected is available to, to move science forward because I think that that's the most important thing to patients and families is that when, when they are participants in studies, um, science moves forward. And so we're gonna talk a little bit about what are the best practices and, and what could be done better. And hopefully, you know, there are people from all different realms in this room, um, this room, <laughs> that, can, that can share what they're doing, how they're doing it, and, and what they would like to see done. Um, and also trying to make sure that um, we're, we're really reducing the, the redundancy and the burden on patients and not asking them to contribute um, more than they're able to, more than they're comfortable to, um, and, and that they are you know, compensated for their time when they're asked to, to, um, to give more of their self and, and their time. Um, I think lastly, I th it would be really great to hear um, some solutions. Uh, if pharma is in the room, I'm not sure, um, but also to, to start to brainstorm together um, how we may work better together in the future, because I think that there's a lot of work to be done. And so TJ and I do not have the answers to all of the questions that we're about to pose. We're going to pull up a slide with some discussion topics. Um, I think, you know, yesterday we didn't get to everything because folks had a lot to say and I love that the group, we, we had over 20 people yesterday. I'm really happy that it's a smaller group because I hope that everybody has the opportunity to contribute. Um, and let's, uh, I'll let TJ kick it off. All right. Wait, we're supposed to have answers. Is that what you just said? <laughs> I didn't, didn't realize. Uh, here's our questions, everybody. These are the things, the topics that Jen and I thought would be great to, to go over. Uh, given that we have a small group, uh, I think we're going to just start the conversation and um, Rachel's going to help us with raising your hand. Uh, there's also the chat box. She's going to moderate that. Uh, but really, um, and Rachel, as much as you can help us out, uh, let's just pull people in to talk because I think the more that we go back and forth, the better this will be. Uh, I'd rather, much rather have hear from you guys and have to talk up here and and babble on, which I do just fine. So uh, the, first, uh, the first point uh, that we wanted to talk about were the, the key misunderstandings and common missteps uh, by advocacy groups and researchers uh, within transparency. Uh, I'm gonna give a very quick thing and then I'm gonna turn it over to Jen because she is the expert on this. Uh, one of the uh, misunderstandings that I've talked about quite a bit in the, in the pharma world is that, uh, that data sharing uh, is uh, uh, the, the excuses they use are long and numerous, uh, impossible is usually the one to come up with. And um, when we come down to it, the, uh, the, the group I mentioned, Transcelerate, which we'll talk about again in a, in a minute, um, has shown that no, we can actually share data and do it in, in ways that are non-competitive uh, because when we do share data, that allows us to, uh, to, to get a, vi ver um, a, a version of patient populations much quicker and with much more efficacy and without so many clinical trials that gather the same amounts of data or redundancy um, 
which I know Jen's going to talk to as well. So I'm going to stop babbling. I'm going to let Jen take this part over because this is her strength. And uh, take it away, Jen. So, I mean, I think that, that TJ touched on this. And again, I want to hear from, from everybody on, on what their thoughts are. But I think the, the thing that's been most frustrating for me and, and specifically in the Duchenne community over the years has been the sort of knee-jerk reaction by both pharmaceutical companies and patient advocacy organizations, and honestly with researchers as well, to own the data and, and to not collaborate and to start their own registry just for the purposes of their clinical trial. And um, what's frustrating and what's difficult is that we all know that not every study is going to come to a therapy. And so when we have a study that ends, there are not always things put in place or plans put in place to then share the data that was gotten and received from all of these people for all of these years in all of these clinical trials. And I've seen some really great players in this. I work with a company that had a failed study. I don't believe studies fail, but that's the terminology. Had a failed study in um, Fragile X, and then they turned all of their data that was interesting to that community over to the community. And I think those are the kinds of things that as advocacy becomes more savvy and makes partnership with researchers and fund studies and gives seed funding, that they make sure that that data belongs to the community and not just one group and is useful. Um, but I would love to hear from other folks um, if they have comments on answer uh, for number one. I'm gonna chime in because we have a hand raised. So Sophia, if you wanna share your sure. comments, questions. Sure. So um, just to introduce myself, um, I lost my baby to mitochondrial disease um, in 2017. I have, um, with my daughters, I have um, also three boys who are healthy. Um, I actually work at Pfizer, so I do have a, a pharma background and experience. Um, I work in uh, statistical analysis, actually for Duchenne muscular dystrophy. Um, Jen already knows we talked before. Um, and um, in my daughter's memory, I volunteered my expertise with data analysis for analysis of patient registry data for mitochondrial disease patients. And um, I just recently had a paper that was just uh, published in March. I can share it after maybe if, if you're interested. Um, and we've learned a lot from, from this data analysis. Uh, the data that I got, it was collected over four years. And, um, and nobody has really analyzed it until, until I saw this data. And what we've learned is that we really couldn't do much with the data. We, my paper really focuses on patients' perspectives and opinions, but in terms of scientific value, there really wasn't any. And, and that was because um, the group that created this registry, they didn't take the steps to design a registry to design registry and design surveys that would actually produce um, accurate data. So one thing that you know that's missing, I think, for a lot of the patient advocacy groups is it's not enough to just have the data. The data has to be in, in shape that can be analyzed and that you could work with. So it's it's really important to sort of think these things through before any patient registry is designed and before patients are submitting data. So that's, that's, that's a very important point uh, because if the surveys are not designed properly, that the data really has no value. There's nothing you can do with it. So this is something, you know, something to be aware of as well as communicate with the researchers and see um, what type of data would be valuable to them. Because for example, if they're only looking for people with genetic diagnosis, let's say, Mm. and we don't know, they, they're not gonna even spend time looking at this data because they're so busy and they don't wanna look at anything that's not immediately valuable to them. So these are some things I've learned. I, I actually uh, presented this paper and my uh, data analysis in Pfizer and they thought it was very interesting and Pfizer is very open to collaborating more you know, with other patient groups or other you know, hear about other patient registries or help if possible. So I'm very happy to hear from anyone and um, connect on that. 
That's true. That brings up a really good point. As a patient advocate, you know, I'm often saying to companies and to researchers, you need the patient perspective. But similarly, if you're a patient advocacy organization, you absolutely need to involve the people who know how to do statistical analysis and the people who are going to develop therapies to make sure you're collecting the right stuff. You don't want to put all this money into something and then have it not be useful. Yeah, absolutely. Anybody else out there would like to chime in? I, I will. This is Monica. Um, I just was going to ask, have you all ever heard of a data stream plan? The, uh, 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 I, it's it's uh, basically strategy for, for data uh, collection in, in your database. And so like you would a, uh, plan a strategy around how you're going to build out your programs in your organization, uh, a data stream, um, uh, and, and I'm new to this because we're building one right now for our database, uh, but it's a data stream plan where you actually look at uh, the, the, the disease as a, as a whole, uh, where the research is, where the gaps are, and, and you plan your surveys around a, a strategic data stream. Uh, a, a plan, an actual plan around building your database. And, um, and uh, I'm just wondering if anybody has ever, ever actually looked at their database or built their database uh, like that. I mean, because we're new to the process and um, I, it makes sense uh, because it also has to do with survey methodology and, and how you ask those questions, uh, you know, uh, being able to to look at collecting your data uh, in, in the way that you're going to get the most empirical data for your, you know, kind of the biggest bang for your buck in collecting empirical data. So I was just wondering, does anybody have like a, a data stream plan or a strategy of how you put together your database uh, and what data you needed to collect before you actually dove into starting a database, I guess? Monica, who are you working with? And I, I'll ask Sophia too, if you have a um, resource or link to your paper, what we've been doing is putting it in the chat. Um, oh. but Monica, also, if you've got a, you know, if you've got a source or a group that you're working with on this data stream, if you have any information to share, if you put it in the chat, but I don't have the answer to that question. So, so hopefully somebody else d does. Okay. Okay. Yeah. I, I can get, I could uh, get you the people I'm working with. Is the question what type of data, how to know what type of data to collect? It, it's more of a, it's a data stream plan. It, it's, it's kind of, you're looking at your, your outcome. What, well, we're looking for biomarkers and measurable outcomes. So when you look at the disease and what we know about the disease already, what kind of questions do we need to ask in our database that, that is going to get us uh, the best possible answer to those questions. And so, you know, it's just basically strategically building your database on the most critical data, because there's a lot of questions people ask in the database, like, like you know, you, you were sharing um, uh, that some of that data couldn't be used, it couldn't be normalized, or you couldn't find any endpoints on it. So this is kind of like a process that, that will, if what we know about like like for instance our our, our disorder is, is epilepsy so when we're collecting all these eeg reports in our database uh what are what are some commonalities that and what are some more specifics around those commonalities let's say the the hertz and the in the in the in the seizures are relatively the same well what are some things around those particular seizures that maybe relate to say behavior or even different types of seizures or you know reactions or uh, we found two reflex seizures doing this. Are you following so our template, Monica? Is, is that what you're getting at? Is there a template? that you, you'd like well, to share on how to, how to do this? Yeah, no, I don't have a template. We're just now starting the process. And so the, 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 the company that we're working with, it calls it, calls it a, a data stream. So it's like a, it's, 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 it's a plan. Uh, and so, but it's, it's, it's kind of customized. So there's really not a template 
I, I don't guess. It's, uh, it's more just a strategic plan on how you build your database. And so what we're, what we're doing is uh, we're, we're taking our existing questions out of our database right now. And we're really analyzing because uh, analyzing how the questions are being asked, but also what we're trying to target uh, in what we know about the disease. Uh, for instance, you know, if there's a question in your database that, that says, if it's not asked correctly, then you're gonna get the wrong data. It's kind of like, if, you know, if a person, or you know, do you have depression? Well, that's not a forced answer question. That's very open-ended because you can feel depressed, but if you ask the question in a way that you say, have you been diagnosed with depression? And that kind of links it back to a clinical record where, where you can back that up. So it, it's similar along those lines. And I was that just- That makes a lot of sense to, to try to create. So one of the things that, that organizations like your own are looking at is, how to create a plan before they just jump into a registry. Right. That right. makes sense. Oh, um, is there anything other than, um, does anybody have any other thoughts about missteps with, with data and transparency that have, have happened that don't include, you know, collecting the wrong endpoints or unusable data? Are there other places that, that there's room for improvement? Or we could move on to number two. We'll take silence as the time to transition. So thank you guys for that discussion. That was really good. Um, and one of the transition points, uh, we got a little feedback from uh, a few people that, that, that work with Jen and I on some of these topics. And, and they mentioned uh, data results uh, and looking for them in, in places like clinicaltrials.gov and trying to find data, uh, study results behind paywalled uh, uh, journals just the, the difficulty in finding more uh, high level data and being able to access that as, as a patient, as a caregiver, as an advocate. Uh, one of the things that I've worked with, and we'll, 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 talk, we'll talk about this uh, in the advances of tools and techniques, uh, is, is the front end part of, of accessing data and sharing data. Uh, I mentioned Transcelerate as, a, as, a, as an organization that I work with, and they have a, a couple different initiatives that are, are looking into how do we get an, in, an input for data so that for clinical research so that we can uh, prevent, present a, a very good user interface to someone who's looking for a trial. And then on the back end of that, that becomes as a trial progresses, uh, you are getting trial results into clinicaltrials.gov. And it, it works in this amazing database way that it should, uh, but that it's, it's in a way that's it's patient friendly. Uh, it's easy to understand. Uh, there are, are things like lay summaries, which we'll we may touch on later if we have enough time. Um, so my, my experience has been that we are now in an age where the tools and technologies are, are there. And, and if you go to a, a number of different uh, conventions or uh, DIA next week, you'll, you'll hear all the vendors that have different ways of gathering this data, uh, of, of pulling it in. Um, but what we want to talk to you guys about is what you have seen that works. What are the advances that don't just look like shiny new things, uh, but are actually facilitating uh, getting the data that you need uh, to um, first understand the trials or treatments that are available, and then uh, being able to use that data that, that, have, that the trials have given you uh, to help make meaningful decisions in, in treatment options. Anyone want to tackle that? We know you have all got tools and techniques, platforms. There are so many platforms that are out there today. What are, what are you using? How are you asking your patient communities to report data to you? Are you using registries? Are you using diagnostics? Uh, I'll jump in while you all think about that. One of the, one of the projects that I, I don't work with on Transcelerate, but is there, there is an initiative to, to harmonize clinical research data and uh, I will, I'll throw this in the, in the, in the chat in a, in a minute, uh, but there's an initiative called Data Accelerate that, that takes uh, data that uh, becomes de-identified and, and puts it in a bigger repository so that now we have a significant number of, uh, of data points for populations. So we're not doing things like running 
the same trials with the same control groups uh, for the same disease states uh, in, in, in my world, in the cancer world, uh, that's become quite, uh, in the last five years, has become a very sticking point because we are doing immunotherapy, uh, a lot of significant immunotherapy work, and yet we're still um, having chemotherapy clinical trial uh, control arms. Uh, so things like artificial control arms and shared, uh, shared uh, uh, control arms among actually across studies so that there's a, a shared control arm where everyone contributes to it and there's much less of a, of a, of a number of patients that are getting, uh, getting a placebo or, or standard of care. Uh, it just increases the number of patients on medication, accelerates drug development, uh, and it avoids having patients make a decision, do I participate in a trial uh, and risk getting a, a placebo or a standard of care? Nobody's got any great platforms that they're that they're using or experiencing. That's fine. I mean, oh, this is this is. I have a sorry, Jen. I have a hand raise. So oh, Jen, you have a hand raise. Time in. Yes, I do. I forgot we were doing that. Great. <laughs> this came up. Hi. So this is Jen Levy. I'm with Coalition to Cure Cal Pain Three. And actually, Jen, we met too in uh, Boston. I think last late last year. Um, so I was going to suggest that for those of us in the neuromuscular field. Um, treat NMD, which is a network that's based in the UK, but it's really truly global. Um, they're working towards um, harmonizing um, multiple things that we're talking about today, things like natural history, outcome measures, registries. Um, so the, I think what I'm particularly interested in this point because of just the stage of uh, the research for limb girdle muscular dystrophy type 2A, which is what I'm interested in, is their um, registry initiatives. And they have an initiative called TGDOC, and I don't remember what it stands for, but um, basically it allows them to make global registries um, by having people use the same data elements um, in their registries. So what be it a patient organization or one of the European national registries, everybody's asking those same questions. So then that de-identified data could be um, collated. So they've done it successfully for DMD and for SMA, um, and now we're working on it for LGMD. So I just thought that was one great initiative um, and a way to really maximize the data that's out there um, without taking away from any individual's ownership of it. There we go. I muted because my daughter was yelling at the dog. Um, <laughs> you're, you're bringing us into number three pretty smoothly. And that is, you know, something that I mentioned that is frustrating is you know, especially in disease states where there are multiple companies and multiple advocacy organizations is redundancy. And I gave this example yesterday with the group and, and I'll give it again, is that through all of my work with the agency, um, with the FDA, they have been very clear that they want us to get along, that they want us to build clinical trials. And as we start to get more therapies in the pipeline, they want us to not be redundant with our data collection efforts. And, and honestly, Janet Woodcock is always pushing for look at the cystic fibrosis community and start doing platform studies, platform trials. And so what this means is that companies have to learn to work together. They have to choose endpoints together, and then they have to choose which registries, which um, places and what type of data is, is being collected together. So, you know, as you know, if there are other members, um, Sophia, I don't want to pick on you because you're the one I know that's in, in pharma now, but if there are other folks that, that have experience working with multiple either patient groups or, or working in a disease state where there are lots of registries, how are you making sure that, that your patients aren't burdened? Um, and being asked to contribute to, to multiple places at multiple times. So um, I don't know so much from my work because at work I work on clinical trials and that's different from patient registry data, but I know from my work with the patient registries that um, it, is, it is hard because usually if there is several patient registries, they're different. They ask different questions. They have a different database data is in different format and to combine this data is a huge effort. Uh, it's, it might be impossible at all 
why do you take so long, you know, um, that it's just, it, it's just too hard. So I think it is very important to, yeah, to sort of, the, the best way would be to have one registry that each patient advocacy group uses. But I agree that it's also hard because even from my work in patient advocacy, I've noticed that different organizations that, that are all patient advocacy group for the same disease, they're pretty competitive. And I didn't find that they, it would seem like, oh, we are all there for the same goal. We, we are all there together. But in practice, I found that these groups are often competitive they don't share what they're doing with each other, and there's no transparency. And I think that I think that's hard. But I think in terms of data collection, that is very hard because when if a company, if a pharmaceutical company gets data that that several databases, they're all in different form and diff, different data is collected, they may not be able to combine it, and some data may just not be used at all. So it is it is really really important. And also, I would say the length of the questionnaires, like. Um, if questions are not needed for, for analysis, they shouldn't be asked because that if the questionnaire is very long, there's a lot of missing data. It's just from a data analysis perspective because people get tired and compliance, yeah. a very long questionnaire. And it's very important to really go, I know like in, in my work as clinical trials, we really go through each question and we, we ask, do we need this data? Are we going to look at it? Are we going to analyze it? If we, if we want, then it's better not to ask a question because I think some people think the opposite way. It's better to ask a question so you have more information. But in reality, when you analyze data, this extra information, it really it confuses things and it makes the other data less accurate too because people skip questions. We've seen that in the Duchenne community. We had a very big and robust uh, registration for Duchenne through Parent Project MD and they realize the compliance level, even with people like myself who recognize that it's important, we weren't uploading our, our information regularly because they asked for so much. And so we've seen them try to streamline over the years. But you bring up an important point, and since I think most of this room is patient advocacy, um, it's important, and from nonprofits, it's important to let people know that you're doing, you know, it, you're doing harm to the community if, if you can't sort of work together and collaborate. So I think that's a great take home. It's something that I've found in every community that you know folks are fighting for resources and things like that. But best practices will say that, that you should be collaborating um, to best serve your community. Yeah, I agree. I have a hand raised, so I'm gonna chime in. Uh, Steve, would you like to, to make your comment? Yeah, I actually yeah. just had a, a question on that point. So is there, um, you know, in your opinion, uh, Kind of acceptable amount of time that um, is the, the right balance between um, you know collecting the necessary information but also getting that kind of response rate you talked about and not overburdening um, uh, the caregivers so we've looked at and and this is actually something that um, tj and i do both work on when we work together with medical we do work and beta test uh, a lot of questionnaires I think, Steve, it's, it's less the time and more the complication, the ability to go back to it um, and, and those sorts of things because folks want to fill out on an app. They wanted to be able to do things quickly and go and fill in the places, not have to pull in data. We've seen um, in, in a lot of my work with patient groups, we've seen that they don't complete a questionnaire if they have to upload data right now before they move to something else or if they have to connect it to a lot of electronic health records and things like that. So if you can keep them right in the app, but I would say the golden number is about 15 minutes. Um, I run a number of surveys. And so if you can do it in chunks, in 15 minute chunks, people will actually do it. Um, but to Sophia's point, really pay attention to, do I really need their entire cardiac notes from their last doctor's visit or is just a summary of their last visit enough with one EKG? you know, for example. So, um, but one thing that I will say is the best way to get that information, every patient community is gonna have a different threshold. And so advisory boards, as you create these, these surveys and tools are incredibly smart to just really beta test it and say, what is your 
um, tolerance level for, for this kind of collection. Yeah. That is a great segue to question number four, uh, because I think it touches on very similar things. Uh, the, the ability to collect data when you need to collect data from a sponsor standpoint uh, is important, but it shouldn't overly supersede the, um, the need for a patient or a caregiver uh, to be able to integrate data collection fairly seamlessly and, and non-intrusively uh, into their lives. In the rare disease state, uh, you all deal with this, um, I'm sure, quite a bit where uh, to add on data collection on top of everything else a rare disease may give you uh, is, is certainly a, is a sort of a double whammy. Uh, and when Jen and I work together, we do not, we work with Medible, but a couple other companies as well that that are looking to make data collection easy and less intrusive and uh, integrated with your, you know, a BYOD where you have a, you already have a, a device that may help you. And if you don't, that the, the, the experience you'll have is going to be similar uh, to something you're already used to. Uh, that's a, a sort of best practice that we've talked about. Understanding that that certain symbols mean the same thing, and not not having someone have to swipe continuously or press press a number of buttons uh, when when one will do. Uh, so, in in that light, is there is are there other best practices that you've seen uh, to the group? Uh, for, for whether it's a platform or a company that's done a good job of, of getting data from you in a way that's accept, not only acceptable, but actually uh, has focused on, on your, uh, your ease of use. If we don't have anybody immediately speaking, let me tease your brains a little bit. Um, I, anybody that works with me, any of my partners in, in pharma will know that I believe that if you're asked to do more than a quick 15 minute survey, if you're really giving a lot of data and a lot of feedback and somebody's going to be purchasing this data, you ought to be compensated. I will um, die on that hill uh, forever that um, patients need to be compensated for their time. And so in my mind, best practices include owning your data and if it's going to be sold you you get some of the money for for uh, putting that data forward the other thing that i think is incredibly important and a best practice is that choice so i i tell this story of working with a patient group a number of years ago and speaking with a, a local chapter leader and i was on behalf of a you know as a patient engagement consultant for a pharmaceutical company and i said you know, something to the effect of, you know, the, the data that was being collected was, um, was really important and, and we really wanted access to it. And she hadn't been made aware that, that her uh, organization was actually selling the patient data to only a handful of pharmaceutical companies and not allowing smaller companies to get a hold of it. And so, you know, I think patients need to understand that they have control over, sorry, ambulance or something, fire truck. Um, <laughs> patients have control. It's important that patients have control over who sees their data um, and, and are reconsented often to decide, you know, do I want to support research? Um, it's something we see in informed consent a lot with my, with my boys when they give muscle tissue, is they say, if we have any extra, who can we give it to? That's an important box. And just to be made aware that if we have extra blood and extra tissue, I do want it for, to give, be given to research, or, or maybe I don't. Maybe I don't support this institution and I don't want it there. But just it, making sure that, that people are aware of where their information is going and have repeated control over that. One thing I'll add to that, unless someone's got a hand up, is that the, the concept of owning your own data uh, has has really come to the forefront uh, G, with GDRP, uh, with some of the California initiatives. And as patients, uh, we should, <laughs> I, I think as patients and, and advocates, um, our health data is certainly way more important to us than it, than it is to, uh, than it is to Facebook marketing data. Uh, so the, the ability for patients to understand uh, what their, what their research data contributes to or, towards and what they can share and what they can choose not to share 
uh, is, is an important part of the conversation that every patient should have, especially uh, early on in the diagnosis where they're, uh, they may not understand everything that they want to agree to. And I believe Candace has her hand up. <laughs> Go ahead, Candace. Yeah, so I just wanted to say um, in terms of an agreement with Jen, because I think her and I have talked about this before a long time ago, um, if a company is asking you to uh, do something for them that is beyond 15 minutes or it takes a certain amount of human uh, labor hour time, uh, there's no free work in this space, especially when you're a nonprofit group and you have a hard time fundraising. So unfortunately, because I am a lawyer and I'm bound by the Florida uh, bars uh, ethics uh, code, I'm not able to speak on specific things that I do in this space. So I have to speak in general terms and I can't say the companies and, and the groups that I uh, work with. But what I can say is I have reviewed multiple contracts on both sides for both pharma and nonprofits. And generally with my nonprofit uh, clients, what I recommend to them is that if the contract seems to be one-sided or there's no compensation for the work of the nonprofit, then the nonprofit needs to go back and negotiate uh, some sort of compensation for it, whether it be an hourly fee for the people going through and collecting the data, the people putting together the registry, um, compiling the data for HIPAA, de-identifying the data, whatever it is. Um, and even if you're not doing that, if you're giving them something, they really should be giving you something in return. Even if it's at a later time, they're going to be funding a program for you, or you know, you need donors and sponsors for a golf tournament or for a gala. Those types of things are okay to ask. And the truth is, is that it shouldn't ever be something where um, you're like, oh, well, my friends in this space did this, so I'm gonna do it the same way. It's a really good idea to consult with your board. If you have a, an attorney representing your group, especially if you're doing some of these larger contracts, you should have an attorney because they have attorneys on their side and looking at you know what, what they're asking for, what they're looking for, what they're set to gain. Don't leave yourself out to dry. There's a very big uh, misconception in the nonprofit space that because you're nonprofit that there's no profit. That's just a, a model for your business. You're still a business. And so in business, you have to have money coming in. And I think uh, given COVID-19, I know a lot of people are struggling right now with fundraising. Fundraising is going to be tough for the rest of the year because people are struggling financially. Uh, you know, don't be afraid to ask for those things. Um, I will say that I've worked with a massive pharmaceutical company on working on the threshold of what's acceptable to ask for uh, from patients. And the one thing I found was that the lawyers in this major pharmaceutical company were afraid to give participants of a major clinical trial Apple watches because they thought that it would be viewed as a handout and that therefore if the patients kept the Apple watch that, uh, that they could get in trouble with the federal government. Now, we know that that's not true and that's kind of silly, but a lot of times some of the people behind the scenes that are not patient facing, that aren't involved with clinical trials necessarily and are just reviewing contracts are not used to this stuff. So it's really, really important that you, you know, you really engage in a conversation just because a contract is put in front of you. doesn't mean that like you read it, you sign it and you're done until you put that ink on that paper. It's a two way street. So don't be afraid to push back, to ask questions, to request edits and also advocate for your organization. At the end of the day, your parents, you're going to be asking your parents and your patients and your caregivers to be doing something. Uh, and at some point in time, it may be a burden on them, even if it's just one night where all the kids are going crazy and mom and dad have to sit down and, and upload files or something like that. But you really need those files because you need them to pull that data for this next project or for this next NIH grant. You, you've got to stress to them how important it is, but at the same time too, you need to create a mutually beneficial relationship. And it's just quickly, I, I wanted to point out, you know, uh, putting data putting data reporting on in the hands of patients and caregivers, you point out something that TJ and I touched upon yesterday that we, we haven't brought up yet today is that if you want them to collect activity, if you want them to video their patient or their child, if you want them to report something, you have to make sure they have the device they need to do that. Mm -hmm. And so it creates this huge gap in you know, access to clinical trials. If you have patients that you can't give a device to, um, we had a very similar conversation in another company that I was working with where I was saying, look, 
if you want families to monitor their child's activity and, and record them, we've got to send them something to do that, whether it's a GoPro or whether it's, you know, a wristband or something like that. And so, you know, it, it's becoming more commonplace, but I have seen it be an uphill climb um, to even let people know. So engaging a lawyer like yourself or in, engaging somebody that really knows that it's not going to be seen in any negative light to not only compensate, but to provide folks what they need in order to participate. Coming from a family that's had to do this for eight years of, of collecting data that doesn't always benefit my family, um, it, it's important that it's not burdensome. Yes, absolutely. And, and I also wanna say that if you are doing something that requires internet access, you need to make sure that all of your families have reliable internet access uh, because that's something else that unfortunately a lot of people um, in the past couple of months we've noticed in a couple of the trials I've been involved with outside of rare disease, which covers a large group of people all across the United States that people were relying on public libraries for access to computers. And since COVID, those libraries have shut down and they're not allowing anybody in. And people may not have a, a, a newer laptop or a smartphone with the capabilities necessary to participate perhaps in um, mo remote monitoring or telemedicine and things like that. So if you don't have that, uh, don't be afraid to ask for funding or to ask them to initiate a program uh, for your patients and your patient group to get access and to have internet installed or anything like that. They do do that. And I've seen the big pharma companies do it. So if you have like a smaller group that says like, we're not sure if we can do that. The answer is yes, they can. They just have to like get off their butts and actually do it. <laughs> so the takeaway from all of that is if you ever have an issue with compliance or legal or regulatory, you call Candace first. <laughs> get her call me, I'll yell at him for you. <laughs> Go ahead and put your contact info in the search bar down at the, the chat bar down at the bottom. We might as well keep everybody's resources running here. Candace, really quick, I, 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 my Wi-Fi actually just went out and I had to pop back on. Um, did you mention, because uh, um, I came into the middle of your talk about the contracts, um, I just wanted to also mention that, you know, uh, as we move into working with industry, um, I, I kind of hear a lot of, um, uh, lots of, I mean, there's been some pushback on, on, on the, the model of sharing uh, data. And uh, I just wanted to, 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 to kind of make the point that it's okay for an organization to ask for patent rights and also uh, royalties in those sharing agreements because that money uh, and your data, if you're giving data over and even investing, uh, even, even investing in those programs with your researchers, you can share in that uh, IP with them. And um, uh, that, you know, I think with the time uh, moving forward, things are changing with patient organizations having control of their own data. And um, it's important that your, your, or your programs in your organization benefit long term to help provide for your community in the future. Uh, with those royalties. The Cystic Fibrosis uh, Foundation uh, really didn't profit off any of that uh, or benefit, I should say, not necessarily profit, but, but they're collecting royalties on a drug that uh, passed with the FDA and it took 10 years to get there. Uh, they invested in it, but now they could take those royalties, put those back in the programs and serve the community that they're serving. So um, you need, you know, when, we're, we're working on sharing agreements right, th uh, right now with the, in the realm of research and sharing our data because it is valuable. And you, you, you do have skin in the game and you don't need to be a martyr as an organization just handing your, your data over uh, without being able to mutually benefit from that or your community. So I don't know if you mentioned that, Candace, or not, but I just wanted to throw that in there. We might actually get to, we have to leave Rachel a few minutes to give you all um, next steps, uh, but we maybe could ask this sort of last one where we're really um, switching gears to, to informed consent. TJ, you wanna give a little intro here? Yes, and this is one of the, the, the projects that I've worked with quite a bit in the former world where um, the transparency and data sharing, and we've been talking about quite a bit here, 
is understanding what happens from resulting from trials. Uh, this is the ability to understand what you're agreeing to. Um, and then also, if you are a trial participant, getting something back at the end that says uh, what has happened with that trial. Uh, it's a little different, um, but the, the issue of transparency remains the same. Uh, what am I agreeing to in, in the informed consent process? It's not a document, but uh, it's, it's truly a process that's ongoing. Uh, and how do you present that to someone uh, who, so they can understand it down here where you know, I'm down in, in South Florida, right, right by Candace. Uh, we have you know, um, plenty of um, non-English native speakers. How do you get someone, something to, uh, to them so that they can understand what they're agreeing to, that, this, that the consent process is done so that they know what they're agreeing to, um, to populations that have uh, low health literacy uh, or rural populations that may be somewhat distrustful uh, of a healthcare system. How do you, how do you engage them to, to understand what they're, they're, they're going to agree to if they're going to participate in the trial? How are you transparent that way? Uh, and too often, uh, and not to pick on lawyers, I apologize, Candace, mm -hmm. but too often these are written um, as legal documents by lawyers and people in the compliance and legal departments, and they're not used to educate. Uh, so uh, that's what I've seen the, the industry get to is the, the recognition that these, these, these documents can change uh, to processes, to things like electronic consent forms, and to uh, use multimedia uh, and, and multi-language so that you can hand someone a tablet as they walk in or direct them to a link that they can look up in, in, in a in a healthcare facility or uh, bring home with them and, and research offline. So they do get a, a sense of understanding. Uh, we only have a couple of minutes, but if anybody has any, any quick thoughts on, on how uh, the, the consent process or a plain language summary process at the end of a trial works, uh, please chime in now. So I'll jump in because um, I, I work a lot with uh, informed consent and plain language as an attorney. So one of the things um, that I highly recommend that a lot of big pharma companies are starting to change and, and get involved with is presenting the informed consent documents in a variety of ways. So you're still going to get the paper and ink because that's what lawyers like and that's what we have to do. And we have to have a paper copy that you have signed or perhaps your child has signed um, if they're of age. And a lot of times the informed consent process, depending on your state, if you're in the United States, um, some children when they reach a certain age, the pharma company may ask your child to also view the documents. But one thing that I've been seeing lately uh, that's sort of picking up is that in addition to the documents, they're doing a video. And so for the parents of young children, the videos are really great because they're cartoons. They may even have characters that represent the disease so that the kids are interested. So they also understand just as much as the parents. Uh, they are uh, working with, in a lot of cases, patient groups and advisory boards from different countries, especially for your larger diseases and conditions. Um, I, I know, for example, um, in the IBS space, they've convened um, multi multi-patient stakeholders all over Europe and Asia to sort of review the informed consent process and, and make it uh, specific to whatever cultural issues are going on. So for our rare disease groups, one of the challenges you have is that you have a smaller patient population that's perhaps spread out over the globe. So you have to be sensitive to the fact that some people may have English as a second or third language. Uh, they're not going to be able to read the legalese that these people put in. And so sometimes what uh, these companies will do is they will take a informed consent document document and give you the really hardcore legal stuff that they have to put in just in case there's mass tort or litigation involved at a later point, uh, but at the same time to break it down for you. Uh, don't be afraid to talk to your sponsors, whether it's a pharma company, a CRO, or whoever about their informed consent documents. Um, I would ask and push and encourage them to have so, an, an advisory board in regards to them, especially if you're a patient uh, group leader and you understand that later on that you're going to have to have your parents sign up. And if you've had a million and a half questions about just putting data in a registry, you're going to have 3 million questions about informed consent for a clinical trial. So you have to kind of think uh, a few steps ahead. Um, and the other thing about plain language summaries, uh, they are mandated under the uh, uh, under European law. The United States as well is shifting that way. Um, major pharmaceutical companies have made a note of this, especially in their legal departments. Uh, so they are working with advisory boards, generally within uh, large, larger disease uh, groups to help 
craft these in a way that are more uh, easy to understand and digest. Uh, if you are involved with them, generally the rule is that you put everything at a sixth grade re reading level or below. Uh, so that way people can easily understand it. And then also do not be afraid to develop an index for your patient communities, even if you just put it on your website, of terms that they're going to run across throughout this entire drug development process from the day you, you, know, you start and you sign up for a registry and you get your diagnosis all the way through to the clinical trial, getting involved with the FDA, perhaps going to Washington to advocate, having a patient-focused drug development meeting and get those out there uh, so that, and let your families know that the, the resources is, are available so they can understand it. And the truth is they're not, they could go to Google and Google what the term means, but if it's coming from your organization and you're able to describe those terms or those issues in a way that they can understand it as it applies to their daily life, they're going to be more receptive to taking the time to understand these complex documents and complex issues in the middle of a very chaotic time of just trying to make it through each day living with a rare disease. Awesome. Thank you, Candice. And that's unfortunately going to bring us to time. You got it right in there at the 2.30 mark. So um, I know Rachel's going to give you guys a couple instructions on the way out. I'm just going to say goodbye and thank you for letting me crash the rare disease space for a, a day or two. Uh, Jen, anything on the way out? No, thank you. We'll put our contact information in the chat box and we can keep the conversations going. Awesome. So I'm going to chime in. I'm going to stop the share and put us all back. Um, just really a couple announcements. First off, big thank you to TJ and Jen for all their help and everything they've done. Um, we've had some really great discussions. So excited that I could be a part of it. And thank you all for all of your input and comments and questions. We really appreciate it. Um, it was fun to do these rare rounds and see people and have human conversations again in a different format. Um, I really enjoyed it. Hope you all did as well. Um, the only thing is to uh, head over to the next session, which I know are starting. So feel free to head out and head over because we have some great sessions and then our closing session at 3.30 Eastern. But besides that, that is all I have for you. Thank you all so much again and enjoy the rest of the conference. Thanks, guys.